Into the wild I'm going, into the wild I am. It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home. Into the wild I'm going, into the wild I am. It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home. Welcome to the Free Birth Society podcast. This is a radical space for women who are ready to celebrate their autonomous choices in birth, motherhood, and beyond. Together, we'll learn about wild birth through personal narrative, we'll explore the politics of birth, and we'll analyze everything that relates to our lives as women from a feminist perspective. Here's your host, Emily Saldana. It's been a wild freedom Today we have a story of life and loss and the deep spiritual experience of carrying life and of birthing death. My friend Leticia joins us today to share the beautiful and heartbreaking story of her pregnancy, her stillbirth, and life after loss. Having felt a clear no to birthing in the hospital, she chose to stay home. And after three days of laboring at home, Leticia and her partner traveled into the hospital to discover that their son had passed on. Join us today for an important and shared story of stillbirth and hear the sacred grace and wisdom Leticia has to share. Come be inspired by how Leticia opened up to spirit, found her calling within the loss of her son, and has devoted her life to becoming the woman she didn't have for women in birth. So we have a a special and sensitive episode today. This is something that, um, you know, I have, I've been waiting for the right woman to um, really, really unpack the experience of death and loss. Um, in birth. And, you know, so for any of you who listen to this podcast regularly and are pregnant and are not up for this discussion, um, save it for another time because we are here to to talk about uh, my dear friend Leticia and her experience that happened not not too long ago with the the life and the loss of of her child. So welcome and, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be in this space that's been such a source of inspiration and light and truth. And um, I hope to be a source of the same for other women. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's you know, this is an important discussion that I've had a lot of requests over the years to have on the the show. And, you know, for reasons that I'm sure are very obvious, um, while there is loss in uh in all communities everywhere um, and that it's a very real part of being pregnant and of, of giving birth. Um, It hasn't, I I I haven't connected with many women who have experience with loss that also had willingness uh, to share in a public arena, which of course makes, makes a lot of sense. And, and kind of the, the obvious downside of that is that when women do go through stillbirth um, with their, with their children, um, there isn't a lot of public content around, around this, especially for women who are choosing home birth and choosing, um, you know, even free birth. So I'm really grateful to your willingness because I know it, is, you know, so often such a lonely experience. So, you know, Leticia and I both really hold the the prayer that this episode goes out to um, the women who need it and that it can find its way, you know, into the the homes and the hearts of any women who are navigating this arena and can feel some solidarity in in the sisterhood that is 
that is this work and that is being alive as women and that is the reality of contending with death. Um, something that a midwife I used to apprentice with would say when when we would experience loss in the practice is, um, she would say this very lovingly, not not cavalier, um, that we all come to go. And that that's something that has helped me in times of navigating loss with family. Yeah, so with that, uh, let's just pass it over to you. And and obviously this was your your first full-term baby, but was this your first pregnancy? Kind of just start us at the beginning of your story. Okay. Yes, it was my first pregnancy. And um, yeah, I've always known I've wanted to be a mother since I was a little girl, you know, of course, always playing with babies. But also I grew up with a lot of cousins and two younger brothers. My second young, my youngest brother was, I was 10 when he was born. So he was like my baby. And um, yeah, I've always really looked forward to the experience of being a mother. I've been a nanny for young children, for a teenager, lots of experience with children, worked in a preschool. And so um, it felt like it had been a long time coming. Um, My partner and I were best friends for eight years before we moved into deeper relationship as lovers. And there was a lot of work for me to do there in untangling and getting clear on if, um, yeah, that this was the man that I was going to like bring life into this world with. And um, I was on a trip in Bali. I was volunteering for seven weeks at a silent retreat center. So spending lots of time in quiet and solitude. And that was my intention for that time was to really get clear and, um, on just our relationship and moving forward. And I had a beautiful sign. Um, I didn't have the concept of spirit babies at the time, but, um, now I can understand it was my spirit babies Hmm. or babes speaking to me. And I was in this these natural hot springs by a river and I was in this creek and these two dragonflies were flying around me. It was so beautiful. And I was just watching their beauty. And then they landed on my leg and they formed a heart as they were mating. And I had no idea that's the shape that they take. And so Hmm. um, looking back, I can see that was my sign. Like, yes, you're meant to be together and you're meant to like bring me into the world. So, um, Months later, at the at the turn of the year last year in 2019, my intention was to prepare our hearts, our minds, our spirits for calling our our baby in. So um, I remember journaling at the start of the year my intentions for the year for that, and also to sit in ceremony with ayahuasca. And you know, I had no idea how this was going to happen. And weeks later, um, it came up in my local community here in New Mexico that there was a sweat. And, um, with this frog medicine, I didn't know what it was all about, but it was combo and it was leading into, uh, the grandmother tea ceremony, ceremony with ayahuasca. And so we went in not really knowing, and we eventually, um, ended up doing the whole weekend retreat. So we started with the sweat and then we did combo the next day we had some time to integrate, but we were fasting. And then we, we had the, this tea ceremony and incorporated the medicine wheel work with that as well. And, um, big weekend. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. (laughs) And, um, that first time, um, at the start of my, my journey, I was looking, I had this Indian opal ring and I was looking into it and I saw these two little purple orbs of light. And again, not familiar with the concept of spirit babies, but now I recognize like those were my spirit babies as well. And so, um, yeah, that was another thread throughout this journey. And we traveled, we were traveling a lot prior to like the spring of last year. Um, So with the intention of getting pregnant, you know, we decided to settle. We had traveled to to Bali. I had hosted or co-hosted a retreat with a friend in Thailand. And um, we had we do the ceremony, a closing ceremony of these bracelets where we tie a red string all together in a circle. And her intention was to call in her baby boy. And so we have these bracelets and so on. And that will lead into another part of my story later. So just giving that as a preface. 
And we traveled to India after that because I was like, you know, we've got to go before we have kids. I don't imagine myself traveling with 10 children to India. And so we went to India. It was incredible. Um, And then when we came back, we settled into a home and started to get more grounded. And over the course of, of being more grounded, we did two more ceremonies with sweat combo and ayahuasca and um and for anyone who's done combo you have a certain number of dots and um yeah the first session I think I did five the second maybe six I don't remember specifics but the third one I checked in and I was to- I heard the number eight and I was like eight oh my gosh that's a lot and I was intimidated but um but I went with it And, um, it was like the most gentle of Mm. all three of my experiences. And the woman who was administering the medicine told me, um, oh, it's the number of Saraswati and, you know, just all these, this different symbolism. And she, I told her, she always asks if you want it in a certain shape. And I asked her for the the infinity symbol um, to reflect the eight. And after she did it, she's like, oh, wow, it kind of looks like a cocopelli don't get pregnant unless you want to then <laughs> do. And, um, so after that ceremony, it was like a couple of weeks after we were in a car accident, actually, um, my partner and I with his family and we were T-boned and it was pretty serious. My partner was knocked unconscious. It was pretty scary. And, um, you know, we were all okay afterwards. It was definitely a big eye opener though. And, um, I was meant to do another retreat in Bali. And so I was meant to leave in like two and a half weeks. And I canceled my trip. I was like, there's no way because I was going to go to Bali and then from there go to Peru to do another retreat with a friend. And so I canceled the trip to Bali and we got pregnant. And so it was like, we were very much so with the intention to call in a baby, but not at that specific moment. So he kind of like snuck in on us a little bit. And um, of course we were overjoyed. We actually, we're not looking forward to traveling to Peru because our bodies were still so, so freshly um, shocked by the trauma of the car accident and traveling just didn't sound appealing. And um, anyways, because I was meant to travel from Bali to Peru, we had separate tickets. So we traveled there separately and I got there before him. And on my way there... I was really sick on the flight and nauseous and, you know, just chucked it up to travel and high elevation. And then once I landed there, I had been scheduled for a massage and I was meant to start my moon cycle. And so I was hoping that I could get there at least first. And um, yeah, sure enough, my blood still hadn't came. And I went to get the massage and I, in the massage, I could feel my womb. Like I could feel it felt like enlarged. And I was like, oh, I guess my cycle's going to start soon. But then there was just something like, or maybe I didn't think I was pregnant quite yet. I don't think, but I was just like, hmm, curiosity. And then I was meant to get, they had after the massage, this beautiful hot tub. And, you know, we're in Cusco, it's winter time there, late winter. So very cold. And the water was like boiling hot and I was trying to get in, but it was just too hot. And there was something intuitively that I was like, I don't think I'm going to get in just for whatever reason. I just don't feel comfortable. And so anyways, later in the evening, I was changing my clothes and I had um, bracelets that we had received on our trip to Bali um, with the same friend who I did the retreat with in Thailand. And um, and she had found out earlier in the summer, like the month before that she was pregnant with her little boy that she had called in. And the way she found out is that, um, her bracelet fell off and it was completely intact. And in that moment she knew she was pregnant and she was only like two days after conception. Mm-hmm. So it was like, there was no other way other to know than intuition. And yeah, she knows she's pregnant. And I have this story knowing that I'm about to see her. She's the one I'm co-hosting the retreat with. So she's on her way to me. And as I'm changing, I see on the bed, my bracelet. And what? I'm like, like, no way. Like, there's no way I'm just making up this story, you know? Oh my God. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, whatever, I just go along, but obviously now I'm more excited and, um, yeah. Anyways, my partner gets there the next day and I tell him and 
he's like, your body feels different. And I was like, really hot and all these things. And then what really sealed the deal is later that afternoon, my really good friend um, for many, many years texted me saying she had a dream. She doesn't remember the content of the dream, but um, she woke up with the thought that I was pregnant. (laughs) So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm pregnant. And I took a, a pregnancy test later just because I don't think I ever had before, maybe once, but, um, yeah, the faintest little line came up. And so we knew for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. we were kind of still questioning, but we knew and it was super sweet. And um, yeah, then that trip was, of course, so magical knowing I had this little babe in mm-hmm. my womb and um, just being in such sacred land, you know, Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley. And um, we had this woman there on the retreat who led a group like Reiki meditation. And in that meditation, I had this visualization of, um, I couldn't see any face, but I had these gloved hands handing me my baby. And it was a little bit like shocking. And Mm -hmm. just, I kind of stored that away and, you know, went on with it. And then I actually had a private session with this woman, um, with Reiki and, and in it, I heard the name Malachi. And so at this point, I'm like, I don't know, four weeks pregnant or so. And so I was like, wow, I wonder if it's a boy and he's telling me my name. And again, just kind of stored that away. And um, yeah, just did some research while I was out there. Um, of course, I just went into full like mode of pre- planning for, for all the things down the line. And I knew I didn't want to give birth in a hospital. Um, so I looked into the local birthing center and um, had scheduled an appointment for like a, a meeting to get a tour and orientation when we got back. But I knew, I just knew that the hospital wasn't for me. I really wanted a water birth and I knew they had that option available at the birthing center. So um, yeah, and then I had this thought, there was all these different things. And now I think I understand it better is that it was both my spirit babies, my little boy and my little girl talking to me, but I had this thought that I was maybe having twins and my partner's a twin. So, oh, um, God. <laughs> yeah, yes. And then all these people around me were reflecting it back to me. Like, I can't, usually I have a clear feeling if it's a boy or girl with you. I just, I can't feel it. I feel both. Maybe you're having boy girl twins. And so, um, yeah, I really was just going with that thought. And, um, so anyways, from the birthing center, they told us they, can, they can't give us care until we're like registered with them or whatever. To, so to seek care elsewhere and up until that point. And um, so I went to the local women's hospital at the recommendation of a friend and had my first like prenatal appointment with a, a nurse midwife. I think she's a nurse midwife um, there. And I told her about my suspicion of twins. And she was like, well, we can schedule you for an ultrasound. And, you know, at this point in being my first pregnancy, I had no idea about any of the risks of ultrasound or anything of the sort. However, my partner definitely was not into it and really Mm. not interested in having an ultrasound. His intuition was very clear on that. And I, being stubborn (laughs) as I am, kind of just overrode him. It's like, no, we'll only do this one. And so... Anyways, we had the nine-week ultrasound. It was just one babe in there. And um, at that point, we had transferred care to the uh, birthing center. And through filling out the paperwork, um, you know, it asks you history and so on and so forth. And I had listed that both my partner and I had a heart murmur at birth that closed up on its own, no medication or surgery needed. Um, And... The, the nurse midwife at the women's hospital had suggested maybe when you do your 20-week anatomy scan, you might want um, an echocardiogram. You can talk to them at, at that point. And so I was like, oh, okay. Didn't think much of it. Um, went to the birthing center, had one appointment there, understood the flow of things and how there's like a rotation of midwives. You don't know who's going to attend your birth. I didn't resonate with a midwife who we saw. And, um, just from that one appointment, I was clear, like, this is not where I'm going to birth. And, um, so then I started seeking the route of a home birth midwife and my partner was uh, attending a school that's all about like natural therapeutics, massage and such. So we asked within our community and were recommended to a woman and, um, we went to 
to this home birth midwife and I met with her by myself the first time. And, um, I had, I was just set that like, yeah, I'm going to home birth. And so I didn't have many questions to ask her. I remember that first appointment. I just met with her and I, I liked her well enough and was just like, yeah, okay, you're hired. She's like, oh, okay. Kind of surprised. I didn't have more questions, I think, or didn't take time to sit with it. And, um, so yeah, I hired her and, um, at that point I had already, through the birthing center scheduled the 20 week anatomy scan with a, no, a local um, perinatal group. And I had spoken to um, her about the echocardiogram and she was like, well, you can talk to them once you're there and they can explain it to you and you can make the decision at that time. Um, she's like, I don't think it's a requirement. It's definitely a choice. And But no one explained to me that um, the 20 week anatomy scan was a choice, which of course Uh now I understand everything's a choice, but it just wasn't presented that way. Yeah. And, um, when I spoke with the midwife I had hired, I, I told her about my concerns with, um, with going to this perinatology group that I had a friend who had been there and they were notorious for just finding reasons to get women to come back and serial ultrasounds and, I didn't want that. And she just said, you know, yes, that is true, but they're really good at what they do. So just go in there clear that you're going to say, you know, thank you. This is all I needed. And no, thank you. I don't want any more. So we kind of like go into it preparing for battle, so to speak. And um, uh, we went to the the ultrasound and um, it was really long and the tech spent a lot of time because she couldn't, can't remember, she couldn't get a measurement or something. And so she's like, I'm going to call the doctor in and call the doctor in. And he was like talking to us very casually. And then all of a sudden he just stopped and um, got really quiet. And then he said he was concerned about something he was seeing with the heart and um, started talking about surgery immediately after birth and started apologizing. I'm so sorry. I know, you know, my, my little boy had to have surgery immediately after birth and I know how hard this must be to hear. And we were just like so disoriented and confused because it just like changed so quickly and there was no like conversation around things. And so, um, my, my man's wife was, I mean, wife, (laughs) my man's mother was with us, my mother-in-law. And, um, she was like, well, should we wait a little bit longer to see if things change and develop? And he was telling us that there's a certain window when they can see things and we need to come back within the next couple of weeks before that window closes. And it was very disorienting and very, very, rough just to experience. And, um, the women after we left there, they were suggesting genetic screening. We were clear we didn't want that. Um, so they sent us to the front desk to reschedule and the woman was not kind. And Mm. we were very clear that we were not interested in, in continuing to see anybody at this space. And they had, um, sent a referral for us to see the pediatric cardiologist and, um, yeah, we were just, of course, like devastated leaving there. I was so upset and just like not knowing what to do. I called the midwife and she was like, well, if they're suggesting you see the cardiologist or, or actually I was asking her about the ge- genetic testing and she's like, if they're suggesting it, then maybe you should do it. And, you know, definitely red flags coming up in different ways. And anyways, um, we sat with it for a few weeks and, you know, every time I would check in with my intuition, I was clear that I didn't feel like anything was wrong with my baby. And and I played the tape a little bit further through and I could see that um, going to the pediatric cardiologist would lead to more intervention that I didn't want, would lead to more ultrasounds that I didn't want, and um, would probably lead to a hospital birth, definitely, maybe even a scheduled C-section. Mm-hmm. And all of that I was not interested in. And so we chose not to go see the pediatric cardiologist. And um, we were bullied and harassed by the the doctor, the perinate. Um, He called me and yeah, was just saying how uh, like irresponsible I was being and, and that I had to consider 
that I was a high risk pregnancy and um, that I that we need to see if I could even deliver in state, talking about out of state delivery and all these things. And so, yeah, we were just not interested in continuing that and cut off that line of communication. And at this point, I was led by a friend to um, a local wise woman who she knew would quell all my fears. And Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she absolutely did. She was just like, there's nothing wrong with your baby. Ultrasounds are poison. (laughs) Like if we were meant to look into the belly, we would have a window, but we don't. So you don't prepare um, to have a broken leg when you go skiing. Like you don't prepare what you're going to do if you break your leg. So why would you prepare for something to go wrong before your baby's even here? you know, and it made so much sense and was so clear. And so she is the one who led me to the Free Birth Society podcast and told me that would be really good medicine for me. So of course, like so many other women, I started just like devouring all of the episodes and was so inspired. And um, yeah, just really, that was the start of the seed planting of uh, being planted, of being able to do it on my own. And, you know, at first it was the whole idea of, well, yes, maybe for my next baby, but because neither my partner or I have ever witnessed birth, um, you know, the first one, we'll do it with a midwife and then maybe next time we can do that. And then I started hearing these stories of women who their first baby, they were birthing unassisted on their own. And I was like, wow, that's so awesome. And yeah, the more and more I listened to it, the more and more I could feel it. And, And then like the climate of the world shifting, this was like you know, January, February, I could like feel this energetic shift. And I was like, wow, I think this is really my call of the work I'm meant to do in the world right now. And um, so at 30 weeks, I decided to um, step away from the care of the midwife. And there was other things. Yeah, there was other things. Um, She was going through a hard time personally in her life. And it was kind of reflecting in her emotions. And um just, um, she had, when we told her we didn't want to go to the pediatric cardiologist, she respected that. Um, and we talked about, you know, the possibility of death. And I told her, yes, we've really sat with it. And we feel like if our baby was to die, we would want it to happen in the sanctity of our own home Hmm. and very clear on that. And, um, and she was okay with that. And, but she did want us to like sign some type of paper saying so, which, um, yeah, just didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And I was happy to do it if we were going to continue working with her. But yeah, just at that point, it was like, I think we're just going to step away. And, um, you know, it was not the, the easiest splitting, but at the end of the day, you know, she respected my choice. And, um, after that, it was like, oh my gosh, this huge weight lifted and so much freedom and ease. And I had such a easeful third trimester, which I feel like is not always the case for mm-hmm. some women. And I was, I think it was my best trimester. I was so happy and just easeful. Um, but I was clear that I did not want to share my plans of birthing um, alone with just my partner, with with my either my mother or my mother-in-law in because I just, their only experience is with industrialized birth. And mm-hmm. I didn't want anyone's fears being projected on me and wanted to protect my space. So, you know, we just kind of went along with it and they would ask how, how everything was going. I'm like, great, you know? And um, yeah, so we didn't share that with anyone except for really close friends. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then... Um, lockdown happened. And um, I was so fortunate as to be in a a women's circle locally, the last one before the lockdown. And I pulled um, a card out out of like, I don't know, 50 cards, a deck of 50 cards with like 20 other women picking a card. She led us through this practice of like closing our eyes and tuning into the card that was for us. And um, as I picked up the card, I turned it over and it was malachite Hmm. and I was just like blown away by the message um that was that went along with that and at that point I was clear I was like we had been wavering on the name and you know we're like we're gonna meet the baby first and um we knew it was a boy because of the anatomy scan we had chosen to 
to to find out the sex of the baby. And so anyways, we had wavered and, and we still agreed that we were going to wait until we met him. But, um, but yeah, that was a really big sign and just his way of communicating. And um, so, yeah, then fast forward um, into May and... I woke up the middle of the night around like 2.30 and um, was really hungry, which was not uncommon and um, went to get a snack and got back in bed. And I started to feel like this psychedelic shift and um, and like these waves. That's the best way I could describe it is I could just feel waves all around me. And then the waves shifted like from the waist down mm-hmm. and... And it was pretty subtle and it wasn't for very long, just maybe a couple minutes. And then all of a sudden I, um, that kind of like dissipated and I could feel just very, very light sensation, like deep in my womb. And so I was like, huh, I wonder if this is the start of early labor because I didn't have any like practice contractions at any point up to that. Maybe a couple times in the night I'd, I had woken up a little bit with some tightness, but nothing much really. Um, so of course, I was very excited and <laughs> tried to to go back to sleep, but didn't really kind of just rested in bed until um, till about six or so in the morning. And I told my partner what I was feeling and for him to get some rest. So yeah, that morning I um, was texting a few of my girlfriends, um, actually the ones from the, the first part of the story, the one I was in Peru with and the other one who sent sent me the text about having the dream and they were actually both um, pregnant with little boys with me. Um, and so one of them had already had her baby, but the other one was pregnant. So it was super sweet to have them be a part of of this whole journey and just telling them I was thinking I was in early labor. So of course there's all this excitement. And um, I was clear that I wanted my mom to be a part of my birth to some extent, but, um, not like fully present in the process. So at that point I texted her and told her I was in early labor. And if she wanted to come over and braid my hair, cause she had told me the story that when I was born, um, her, her mom, my grandmother had braided her hair. And so I thought that's that was sweet. Really, yeah. Just a really sweet way of connecting us. And, um, and so she came over, of course, she's so excited and braiding my hair and she shows up with my stepdad, which I wasn't expecting. So that was just like a little bit throwing me off, but you know, it was fine. And like I said, I was in very, very early labor. So I'm still just like hanging out, talking, just light sensations. And she braided my hair and then the landlord came over and that was super weird. <laughs> and I hadn't want, want, to him to know that um, we were birthing at home in this house and she told him and you know just aye, aye, aye. All, all these funny weird things and so then um, I had sent my partner to go get bagels and like ice chips and things in preparation and he came back and he was like what is going on like all these people here how are we going to get rid of them and <laughs> I just told him, I was like, you know, I'm just going to tell them that I'm going to take a nap and rest and we'll call them when we're ready to see them again, you know? And so my mom definitely didn't want to leave, but they ended up leaving and she's like, call me. Even if I turn right back around, I'm happy to come back. And I was like, I, yeah, I'll let you know and I'll call you. So they left and, um, I, like I said, I knew that I was in very early, early labor. I was planning for at least three days and would be happily surprised if it was any shorter. So I was like, okay, we need to get some rest. So we got back in bed and tried to nap. Couldn't really sleep. So I was like, let's watch a movie. We watched a movie. I, um, and the sensation started to pick up a little bit and this like late afternoon. And so I started to um, do like a yoga nidra meditation and then it started to get towards the evening. And so I did some smudging and I had three candles on my birthing altar that I lit at that point. And um, yeah, just trying to like kind of drop into the zone as it got darker. I figured things would pick up a little bit and they did. And um, my partner right away wanted to fill up the birth pool. And I was like, no, no, it's too early. Like, I'll let you know when. And um, so I just spent some time kind of 
walking around and swaying my hips, listening to music. And I don't know at what point, but that first night, maybe somewhere in the middle of the night, things started to pick up just a little bit, really. And I was like, okay, I think you can fill up the birth pool now. So I filled it up and I got in and immediately like everything stopped. (laughs) And I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should get out. And so, yeah, then the next day came and um, I was totally cool and patient. My mom checked in with me. I was like, you know, this, I know this is a a Taurus baby and will come in his own time. And um, I feel fully confident that my body and my baby will move at the perfect pace and I'm all good. And, you know, at this point I'm still eating and talking and, you know, like nowhere near active labor, still very much so early labor. And yeah, so I made it through the whole next day. And then that night is when things really started to pick up a little bit more. And, um, my partner fell asleep at some point and felt so bad. And I was like, no, you need to rest. Like you're not sustained by the same energy I I am. And I need you to be up and like with it when I need you. So I was laboring by myself through the night for a lot of it. And, um, and then it started to pick up some more and I woke him up and asked him to support me with the rebozo and bring me some more food. And, and then the, the following day came the next, day with the sun and things stayed a little more sustained throughout that day. And I knew that there was a full moon that was going to be at its peak. So I was figuring that maybe that next night the baby would come. And um, yeah, the labor started to pick up throughout that day. And and actually the night before I had thrown up and I was like, oh, maybe this is transition. <laughs> but I, felt, <laughs> I felt like, but I don't feel decimated yet. Right. Like I don't feel like it's that intense. So um, yeah, little did I know that was nowhere near. Um, but throughout the day I felt like, well, maybe I need to go outside and like put my feet on the earth and I did and I was holding onto the tree and it was so intense and the contractions were just building and building and that really did help like keep the energy a little more sustained. And then by that evening, um, things were really intense and consistent and I started to get pushy, not pushing, but just pushy. And, um, and I was just like in the bathroom laboring a lot more, like laboring on the toilet was really supportive and, Um, and then I remember just like, okay, I really need to like go within and ask what I need to do to bring this baby down and out. And as I did that, I heard like that, that very quiet, subtle inner voice that was like, you need to go down into the darkness. And, and that's something that like in my life has been reflected. And, you know, this, this, desire to always stay on the light side of things and um, to not really go into those darker places and spaces. And so I was like, all right, like, this is what it is. This is my journey. And I started to um, hold on to the sink and like squat down to really like feel the weight coming down and just like the whole energy of going down and just that downward flow. And um I was in the shower a lot and I remember getting out of the shower and telling my partner, like, I need you to help me. And he was like, what do you mean? I said, just pull the energy down. And so I was having him like grab up and pull down just in front of me. And I could feel the energetic flow like coming through me. And he, we had borrowed one of our friends, like shamanic drums and he was drumming a lot. And that was really helpful. Like through each wave, just this was this really beautiful sacred shamanic space we had created um with his drumming and the quiet and sometimes I had music and just going in between and that was really when I felt like I was traveling down into the underworld it really did feel like that once it became dark that last night it was just the moon was full and outside the wind was howling and there was branches breaking and it was just god so wild. And, um, and I knew that it was a Scorpio full moon and the Scorpio energy being all about death and rebirth and transformation. And, you know, it was like loosely in my consciousness, but I wasn't focused on that, of course. And, but it really did feel like 
traveling down into the underworld, but not in a scary way, really. Just like, this is the journey you have to make to bring your baby Earthside. And and um, so I had been pushy for a while. And I remember like I had this vision of, of my cervix opening and could just feel my body opening. And, and then um, the after being pushy for so long, I felt, I started to feel like I was getting stuck because I was like, oh, I feel like my body's like been pushing and I'm like, there's no baby. But I realized now that was just pushy. That wasn't mm-hmm. pushing. Totally. <laughs> and, and how, how far into your birth at this point would you say you are? Like what's mm-hmm. the time that's elapsed? So since that, that first night of waking up in the middle of the night, this was the third night. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so that's a, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It had been some time, you know? And, um, and so throughout that night, um, yeah, I was just kind of feeling stuck and, and then a big turning point, my partner said was, um, one of the candles I had lit. So I told you I lit three candles. Two of them, of course, were out, but one of them had stayed over all this time. And it didn't even go out. It was in a plastic like container and it started to burn through the plastic and have this horrible smell. And so he's like, oh my gosh, I have to put this out before she smells it. But he said that at that point when the candle went out, he felt like that was it. Like time's up. Something's mm. something's not right. He felt like that was his first inclination that something wasn't quite right. And at no point did I feel like there was anything wrong. I didn't feel fearful. Um, I just felt stuck. And so at this point, he was communicating with um, some other women in my circle. And, you know, they were kind of energetically in our space and just putting things in his head. He was really worried about my cervix dilation, which is like totally irrelevant, such a mind fuck. And I advise any woman to not go down that path and just, you know, not even think about that. But um, yeah, he was just feeling like, what do you want me to do? And so I, I asked him to write a message within the, the free birth network space and to call on the wisdom of the women in there and lots of women replied and were very helpful and supportive and um, we're just suggesting um, birthing stool and toilet and different stuff and um, at this point the sun had come up for what the fourth time and I was really feeling exhausted I was falling asleep and I had to like go into the room with the light to stay awake and was just really like done and I feel like this was the point of transition. And this is why I was feeling this way. And had I had another woman with me, she could have been like, you're right there, just keep going. Um, But that wasn't the way my story played out. And um, so at this point, we started to see, um, I started to notice a little bit of meconium, just like some green stained water leaking. And that was the first time I had seen it. So I was like, huh, that's interesting. And we decided to call upon our local wise woman and just seek some advice. And um, she gave us, she was very grounded and just, you know, gave us advice. Typically, if you see three signs, then maybe that's baby telling you something. And um, she asked the last time I had felt the baby move and I couldn't remember and knew it had been hours. And so, um, yeah, uh, we talked about transfer and what that would look like. And if I felt like that's what I wanted to do. And at that point, um, I felt like that's what I wanted to do. And I fully made that decision, um, in full, uh, autonomy and she didn't coerce me or anything of the sort, just helped me organize that and really talked me through it. And, um, so we started to get ready to, to transfer to the hospital and, of course, it's like such a days after being in labor for three days and all of a sudden it's light out and you're walking to the car. And, you know, I'm at this point, I feel like he had descended into my pelvis and because I just, I couldn't get in any position that was comfortable. The car ride over was so uncomfortable. Luckily, it's only like 10 minutes max. Um, and I talked to the doctor uh, who was going to, received me at the hospital. Um, and 
it was a man, which I wasn't super stoked about, but uh, he's the doctor that all the local midwives work with for transfers and mm-hmm. respects women choices. And so he did tell me that if I came in and I was only like at five centimeters, would I want to go back home? And I was like, yes. And I was very grateful mm-hmm. to hear that. And um, so again, because of all the COVID stuff, we were told that my partner couldn't come in with me Mm. and that I would have to go to triage first. And then once I was admitted, he could come up. So retrospectively, I wish we would have fought that a little bit more, but you know, we were just totally out of it and just kind of going through the best we knew how at the time. And so, yeah, I walked myself up and was in such a daze, like couldn't believe I was in the hospital. Yeah, totally. this is where I was and walked into triage and checked myself in and, you know, was very much so in active labor and having really intense contractions. And it took them about 30 minutes to get me admitted. Uh, I was the only woman there. And I guess they told me there was emergency happening. And that's why doctor was busy, whatever have you. Um, But I was hesitant to, to tell them how long I was in labor. I had been in labor and I had noticed like a steady leak. It didn't, I don't feel like my water's ever opened. There was never like a gush, but um, definitely like water trickling. And so um, anyways, finally they got me into a room and um, the woman came to check me with the Doppler and I almost asked for her to not use it. But then I'm like, what are you here for, Leticia? Like, yeah. You, you know, like this is why you came in. And um So she started to use the Doppler and she's like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to actually do the ultrasound. And then she turned on the ultrasound and it was so painful Mm. because I was having active contractions and, you know, they press pretty hard on the belly and, um, it was so painful. And she was like, Hmm, I'm going to ask for a second pair of eyes. And at no point was this like flagging me. I wasn't worried. I was just like in labor, obviously. And, So another nurse came in and they're looking and then a few more come in and someone asks if she can check my cervix. And I didn't want her to, but I hesitantly agreed. And she was right away like, she's complete. The head's right here. And the energy really started to shift at that point. And then that same nurse came and kneeled down next to me and was like, we can't find a heartbeat and I'm very concerned and was very frantic and I was really pissed off and just like can I call my partner now you know and because I was alone at this this whole time and so she was like yeah um give me your phone and I'll call him for you so then they're wheeling me into another room and in that time she calls my partner and tells him over the phone that they can't find a heartbeat oh Yeah. And so... Oh my gosh. Yeah. Then we, I get wheeled into the other room and luckily there was one decent woman who came over and grabbed my hand and just said, you know, there's going to be a lot of people in the room. Just take some deep breaths. And so I started to take some deep breaths and my partner luckily showed up very shortly after and was crying. And I was so confused. I just didn't... Did you hear the nurse say it to him on the phone? No, I did not. Okay. I learned this afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, then, um, then he came and was by my side. He's like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like we did our best. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? He's like, they can't find the heartbeat. He was just crying. And I told him, I was like, no, no. Like, he's just really low in my pelvis. I think that's why they can't find it. Like, he's just, he's about to come out. And that's Mm. why he's he's just really low in my pelvis. And I feel like, you know, the body is so intelligent. This was really self-protective for me to still be in the mindset, you know, of like, my baby is alive in order to go through the process of still birthing this baby, Mm -hmm. right? Like... Um, so yeah, I was not convinced at all. Like I didn't feel upset or worried. I just was like, you know, my baby's going to come out and prove everyone wrong. They did another ultrasound with a different doctor. And then at this point she came and said, I'm so sorry. We can't find a heartbeat. And Mm. this means that your baby passed away at some time during labor. And 
again, like that just didn't hit me. I was just like, nope, they're wrong. My baby's gonna prove everyone wrong. And yeah, I just was not accepting that. And um, then shortly after that, the doctor came in and he came in and introduced himself and asked if he could hold our hands. And um, I think, you know, he meant well, but it was just a weird thing. Mm. and didn't feel very genuine or authentic. And um, it was just kind of awkward. And so it was what it was. And he was like, okay, we need to talk about what comes next. And, um, you know, you have to birth your baby. I'm like, well, obviously, <laughs> you know, it was just like, yeah, duh. And, um, um, my partner right away said, well, she wants to have a vaginal birth. And he was like, yeah, definitely. So I was grateful that there was no talk of C-section or anything of the sort. Um, so he was like, okay, well, why don't you, and I'm laying on my back, super uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. I hadn't been on my back this whole time. Um, and so he's like, okay, why don't you give us a push? So I told him, I was like, well, I'm not having a contraction. And then he was like, okay, we can wait. So we waited. And then once another contraction came, I pushed a little bit and he was like, and I, and I told them, you know, this is not how I, I birth. I, I, I'm really uncomfortable on my back. Can I, can I move? And he was like, do you want to get on hands and knees? I was like, yeah. So flip on hands and knees and it's so bright in the room. And so my partner asked if we could like close the curtains or something to make it a little darker. And they were like, no, I'm sorry, we can't. And so then I'm on hands and knees and it's just so awkward and like I'm on display, you know, and uh, they're like, okay, give another push. I told them, well, I'm not having a contraction. So I waited again, had another contraction, started to push and, you know, they gave me like maybe a couple of minutes. And then he said, I'm afraid that if you've been laboring so long, you know, your body's tired and might need a little help. So maybe we should talk about some Pitocin or the vacuum. And I was very clear that I did not want Pitocin. I had been in labor for days and knew that that would increase the intensity and just was not interested in that. So I was like, okay, what does the vacuum look like? And um, he was like, well, we'll attach a suction cup to the baby's head and just help you push him out. Like you'll still be pushing, but we'll just help give a little traction to bring him down and out. So I was hesitant, but agreed. And um, as they were getting everything ready, he started to talk about, I don't know, he said something and said something about tearing. And I was like, tearing? Well, I don't want to tear. He was like, oh yeah, well, I'll, I'll show it to you before we do it. So that made me a little bit nervous, but um, he showed me the the size of the, of the suction cup and um, yeah, I didn't really feel like I had a choice. And uh. um, yeah, so they put my feet in stirrups, which was horrific and laid me on my back and attached the vacuum and waited for another contraction and started to push. And then it felt like the most intense sensation um, I've ever felt in my life of just this intense suction. And of course, you know, my baby was emerging from my body. So that's an intense sensation in and of itself. But um, yeah, in one push, his whole, I don't know exactly how things played out. I wasn't watching, but I had asked them if, um, if my partner could catch the baby and they were very hesitant. Like, I don't think they expected that, you know? Um, I just wanted him to be the first one to touch my baby, our baby. And, um, they were like, well, we can let him feel the head. And yeah. So, so I guess what happened when I asked my partner is that, um, his head emerged. And at that point they, they offered for him to touch the head and he was like, no, no, like he didn't want it to take any longer me to, to be in that space any longer than was necessary. And so then, um, then shortly after his body emerged. So I feel from my memory, it was in one push, like his whole head and body emerged. So it was very fast. Um, and they had asked me if I wanted to do immediate skin to skin. I said, yes. So as he came out, um, they handed him up to me and, you know, I was like any new mother, just 
admiring my baby, getting to know my baby, looking at my baby and holding him and just like in complete amazement that this little being I had grown and birthed out of my body. And then I started to feel a little bit of traction on the cord and I knew what was coming and I so badly wanted to like tell them not to rip the placenta from my body, but I didn't have the capacity to say anything. And it was like kind of in slow motion. I was watching it all play out, you know, a little bit. When, when does it like hit you? I mean, not until I called my mom. Ugh, and you had to say it. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, because, you know, after they pulled the placenta from my body, then it was like, you know, the fundal massage was just like the most painful thing in the world and um, Pitocin in my leg. And I think that really affected things and, you know, like just my emotional ability to process anything. Um, yeah. And, and my mom knew that we had gone to the hospital. We had called her on the way there. And because of the virus, no one was allowed except for my partner. And so, yeah, after, after the very managed third stage, luckily we, um, they left us alone and gave us some time to just be together. And it was like, if you didn't know any better and you were just like a fly in the wall, you would think it was just a new family meeting their baby, you know, we were just like admiring them. And because for me, it really hadn't sunk in. Just, I was, yeah, just still kind of in between worlds. And, and then, yeah, making that phone call, that first phone call to my mom was when I cried for the first time and it slowly started to sink in, but there was so much shock you know, and, um, and then of course, afterwards, the doctor was trying to find any reason why, um, you know, my baby was born still and started to say that it looked like he had a club foot, which he definitely did not. It was just, you know, babies are all curled up in the womb and it was still kind of just like a little squishy from being inward and um I could see clearly I know what a club foot looks like and it was nothing like that and really pushing us to get genetic testing and do an autopsy and we were clear that we were not interested in that and luckily um the genetic counselor was very kind and didn't really bother us and was very respectful and and then we had the whole ordeal of um of not being able to take our baby home or not even really having the capacity to think about that, honestly. Um, Luckily, uh, that same wonderful, amazing, wise woman had the the grounded thought to um, send us information about a a natural burial um, company, I guess you could call them, here in New Mexico. And... um, put us in contact with them. And so we spoke to this really kind man and he told us that um, legally we could take our baby home with us if that's what we chose to do and was trying to help us organize all of that. Um, And so he was born around two o'clock in the afternoon and we spent the whole evening trying to see if we could take him home with us. But unfortunately it's... um, yeah, it's not legal to <laughs> to take your baby home mm. and um, care for your own dead. You know, it's like we have such little autonomy in birth already and then in death, even less. And um, yeah, just really, really confusing and, you know, so tired, so exhausted, haven't eaten and trying to make all these decisions. Luckily, the the doctor that was on call that evening was very kind and very supportive, trying to help us sort all this through. And, um, and eventually it came about that we weren't going to be able to take him home with us, but um, we could come back the next morning and they would release him to us with um, 
with the help of New Mexico Natural Burial, the people there. But it ended up being a blessing that we didn't have him come home with us because, you know, there was the whole, like, how do you care for his body and like keep his body cool until we can return it back to the earth and, um, you know, resting and healing from birth. And so anyways, and I was clear that I did not want to stay in the hospital any longer than I had to. And so I had to make that difficult decision of, um, yeah, like leaving my baby behind. And that was the weirdest, hardest thing I think I've ever done. Um, (sighs) Yeah. And I had, luckily, my wonderful family and dear friend waiting at home. They, my, um, my mother in love had cleaned up the whole home because we had just left. I'd been laboring there for three days. There's chucks pads everywhere, the birth pool water. She had cleaned everything up, her and my friend. And my friend had made me a warm meal and they were all waiting for me, which was so sweet. And you know, everybody gave me hugs and we were crying together. And, and then we went to bed. And um, yeah, waking up the next morning was horrific. Just in pain and like kind of in this like waking up from a nightmare and realizing that the nightmare was your new reality type mm, totally. orientation. And it took many, many months to even like reorient. It felt like every morning I would have to wake up and reorient to this new reality. And I feel like being pregnant is such a dream, dreamy liminal space anyways. Like you can't believe there's this little being inside you. And then to all of a sudden, like have your belly being deflated and no baby is just like this whole other weird in between dreamy reality, you know, and, um, yeah, luckily I have such an amazing community and that same loving wise woman came to visit me the next day and just offered me loving womanly support and really, I feel like spoke some word medicine to me about my milk coming in because that was a question I had and um, just said, you know, I don't think you're going to have any problems. You're not going to have any problems with engorgement or mastitis. And, you know, if you want to, you could like bind the breasts. It seems kind of counterintuitive, but it'll just, it can help, you know, the milk to dry up faster. But um, if it doesn't feel good to you, then don't do it. And just, you know, let this be part of your healing. And Mm -hmm. as your milk comes in, just let it flow and cry, let your tears flow and just like, let this be a part of your healing. And, um, just like grief can be really healing and cleansing, you know, let it be cleansing instead of stagnant. And that was so helpful. And just talk to us too about planning a ceremony to, to honor his life and return his body back to the earth. And just that so many of our, our death rites or our burial traditions have been taken from us. But if we just tune into our intuition, we can, we can remember them. And, um, and so as I spent some time thinking about it, I, I thought to offer some tobacco and some corn and some water. I wanted one of each of the elements to be with him. And um, we had another local wise woman and her partner who is actually from Peru and um, they have a beautiful medicine garden. And so I asked them if we could have some corn and tobacco from their garden. And so it's sherry or the, the sacred tobacco from Peru and we were given that and some corn that I, I anointed and his body with. And um, we had a beautiful ceremony a week later with just our intimate family. And it's, it's this piece of land that they have near the mountains. And it's all just like wide open desert. It's very peaceful, very sweet. And it felt so right to be outside in the wide open desert space and um 
yeah, we, we crafted this ceremony to honor him and, you know, went around the medicine wheel and just spoke blessings to him, sang to him and, and offered his body back to the earth. And it was really sweet and healing. And I was so grateful for that. And um, how long after his death was that? It was a little less than a week. So he was born on a Friday and the following Thursday, we went and did that. And um, yeah, it was so powerful and You know, my community really rallied around us and brought us food and offered us all different types of healings. I had two beautiful sisters come and do a closing of the bones ceremony for me and a birth healing meditation. And um, yeah, it was in this postpartum time that I really became clear that um, I needed something to redirect my energy towards because I had carved out all this space in my life for motherhood. And that was just simply not my reality anymore. And, um, and I had known of the radical birth keeper school and I was interested in it, but I was like, there's no way I could do that with a newborn. And then when everything shifted, I was like, Oh my gosh, yes. Like I have to do this. (laughs) You know, this is, he's been leading me to this and um yeah and I got in touch with you and signed up for it like a week before the school started I Mm -hmm. think and (laughs) it was such a necessary piece in my healing and I feel like it is the reason I've been able to process and integrate in the way that I have and redirect my purpose because I do feel like this whole story between us is all about like reorienting me to my life's work and Mm, just like stepping into this highest version of myself and just his powerful little soul guiding the way so that I can serve other women and, and be the woman that I wish I had Mm -hmm. during my pregnancy and birth. So what do you think... Like, what do you now, this many months out, kind of make of his story? Like, what do you think happened? I Mm. I get that it's a totally unanswerable question, but I'm kind of going back to what you were saying about your pregnancy and the flags on the ultrasound. and, And I'm assuming you didn't do an autopsy. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We did not do an autopsy. And, you know, um, I feel like the way that I process is much more in the realm of spirit than like the what happened Mm -hmm. physically. Like, was it his heart? Was it, you know, I just, to me, that doesn't really matter. Um, It is what it is. And I'm at peace with the choices we made. And I do feel like though, with all the communication I had with him in pregnancy, it was like, this was always going to be our story, mama. Like, this is what we agreed to do together. And like, just thinking back to that vision, um, in my early pregnancy when I was in Peru of the gloved hands, like delivering my Mm -hmm. baby, I was like, wow, this was always going to be my story, you know? And, um, and that card that I pulled at that women's circle, like the message was so potent at the time, but then to come back to it months later, like, it was, it was days after his birth, but just, yeah, like processing that and remembering that card and just a little bit of what it said is when our will is aligned with the divine will, however, we will become channels for manifesting that which is for our highest good. We release the need to create specific forms and open ourselves to manifesting that which will help us in fulfilling our purpose on earth. In this way, every creation that we manifest will fulfill a need, even though it may not manifest in the form we expect. And I was just blown away. Like, 
you know, sitting in my grief a couple of days postpartum, like reading that message and just like, wow, like this is what he was communicating to us. Like that this relationship was going to, it took shape and form in a way different than we expected. But specifically at this time in the world, like he came to use death as the teacher and to teach not only myself, but those around us, how to have a healthy relationship to death. And that this, you know, what is life if we're always running from death and just how to like really live life and, and honor death as well. And that both are birth and death are such sacred portals and to like be in the midst of both at the same time was just such a potent experience beyond words that I feel like I'm really learning and doing my best to alchemize into, into wisdom that I can offer to others and just, yeah, really live out the purpose in the world. And, and yeah, I mean, I guess that's the best I can put it to words is just that this is what had to be at this time in this way. Yeah. Hmm. It's a big story. Yeah. And I'm really hearing that if a woman had been, I mean, could have, would have, obviously, it's a, you can never rewrite the same story. But if a woman had been able to hold that space for you, not that the outcome would have been different, just that, you know, that that he could have been born in your home and and what a different experience that could have been. Yes, absolutely. I fully feel that. And although, of course, I've made peace with my story and I can see the wisdom in having lived out a hospital birth experience, um, I do in my heart believe that, no, it wouldn't have changed the outcome. He, I don't mm-hmm. believe he would have been born alive, but I do believe that he would have been born a lot sooner at home than he was at the hospital because of all the time to drive there and so on. So yes, I definitely do believe that and just really see the value in having a woman as an anchor in the birthing space and just that deep desire that I feel is innate in each of us as women to be witnessed by another woman in birth. And now you've gone on to become a radical birth keeper and you're attending birth. So how, how does this, it just, it sounds, you know, it sounds kind of taboo to say this, but like this whole experience just sounds so expansive for you. It just sounds like it, it blew you open into a whole nother realm of, of being on this planet and and contending with with everything that we contend with in the spirit world and in the physical world. And yeah, I'm just thinking about you now being a birth keeper and how is that for you to to go to births and hold that space? Yes, I I feel like this has been such an expansive experience when I allow it. Of course, there's times when I contract and, you know, want to run away from the darkness as is my pattern. But um, really just distilling the wisdom of um, the fruitful darkness and and the beauty that comes from that. And that that is synonymous with birth, right? Is like, it's this fruitful darkness and um, being in that space with another woman and holding like that shamanic space where birth and death are both in the room, you know, life and death. It's like, that is the portal. And um, just what an honor it is to be invited into that sacred space. And there was definitely uh, a worry, a fear about like, what would a woman want me to come to her birth knowing my story? Uh Like, you know, is it, am I bad luck? Um, a bad omen, you know, <laughs> and no. really feeling that. And then I met this amazing woman who I've been supporting and 
I told her my story, you know, flat out first, first time meeting. And she was just blown away and was like, yes, that's who I want at my birth. Like you have walked through the fire and you have, you know, met death and been with death. And, um, that was such a, a healing conversation to have and to, to feel that resonance with her and yeah, to just, just what an honor it is that my son's spirit and our time together has led me into really stepping into my life's work. Wow. Your little guide. Yes. Yes, he is. Yeah. And it's just, I'm just kind of reminded to the be, you know, where we where we started this conversation from that there's such a a taboo around obviously death in general and then even more so around child loss and infant loss and stillbirth and um you know everyone who listens to this podcast I'm sure understands that um babies are 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 not allowed to die in our society and and if they are going to die they're only allowed to die you know, in the hospital and with, with great explanation and with, um, you know, being able to say we've done everything medically and with all the machines as humanly possible. And um, it's just, there's such a huge gap in, in, you know, in, in womanhood today where, where this space, I mean, even to um, accept death is quite a taboo concept. And, you know, I've watched you navigate this with such grace and humility and openness and curiosity and softness. And really, it's really struck me to observe your process. And of course, I'm not in your head. I'm not pretending to know what what every quiet moment is like for you. But it has struck me that you you never seemed to have done that thing that a lot of a lot of people do around death where um, we frame it as a punishment and we frame it really as something that we are victimized by. And it's not at all to judge anyone who does that. It just has really struck me um, that you didn't do that and that that it doesn't seem like you walk with this story as proof of punishment you know or see death as punishment and it's it's something that for me I certainly thought a lot about when I was pregnant and of course as a birth attendant I I think about and and I talk about it um and just it's a very mature and and beautiful and and spiritually integral um, you know, kind of way I think of of exploring these waters to to be willing to try on that. You know, your son, for example, like lived a full life, and that that really can be true, and that that actually could be, like I've heard you say, you know, throughout this school, like that that is a way in which you honor him to to let this be his complete life. And that's just so, yeah, so helpful, I think, to hear and so inspiring and grounding in its truthfulness. Yes, and I feel, you know, just being in the school and all the tools we learned was so supportive in my processing of grief because, you know, there's the stages of grief and I feel like everyone moves through them differently and weaves in and out. But um I really felt like the acceptance part for me was really what I had early on. And I didn't really dance with the darker anger and deep sadness until later. And and in that space, I had to allow myself to be in that space. But also what kept coming back was, how is this for me? And I really just continued to find all the reasons why this supported me in expanding and deepening my relationship to life, to my son, to my partner, to all everything around me. And that has been 
just my own personal process and how I've been able to, yeah, stay out of the story of, of blame and, and being at the effect of this, this story that's played out in my life and, and just use it for greater fuel and purpose because there's definitely been days and even weeks where I can't get out of bed. And I think that's totally normal and a part of the process. Of course. However, I don't want to stay there. And I don't want to let his life and everything we've been together be in vain. I want to use it to fuel me to move forward in more integrity and with more purpose. And um, yeah, it brings me a lot of joy and excitement to see what's next and to feel all the the magic that's been a part of this whole experience and and to really like not fear death anymore because I have just been there and and birthed it even you know and what a what a freeing way to be in relationship to life yeah well, is there anything else that you want to make sure gets said? Um, if anyone wants to connect, um, my Instagram is Enchanted Birthkeeper. My website's Enchanted Wellness NM um, dot com, and I, yeah, I'm always happy to connect with other women who are walking a similar path or needing support and just so, so grateful for the space to share this story and to honor his life and purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sister. Thank you so much. And that's it for today, my sisters. Check out everything we do, including one-on-one and group coaching, learn about our private membership, in-person retreats, and more on freebirthsociety.com. Our online courses are on freebirthsocietycourses.com, including our flagship course, The Complete Guide to Free Birth. Don't miss the Radical Birthkeeper School if you're ready to become the authentic midwife that women are searching for. Together we rise and the revolution starts inside each of us. Our opening song is by Shy Ray. And now I'll leave you with our Free Birth Society theme song, Wild Woman by Aruba Red. I honor you for the wisdom you held, the ancient traditions of plant medicine and womb magic. I feel the spirit of the ancestors as I place my hands upon my belly. This sacred portal will be honored. Eons upon light beams of survival Withstanding the eradication of our power by design I will not allow the separation of our young to be forced upon me My sisters will no longer birth in captivity The picket line redefined from burning our wild women To paralyzing us and drugging our babes Strapped down in a clinical white bed Drying up the milk from our breasts Keep your needles My family will never again be doomed to chase those dragons or your poison. We reject your fear. We choose love. Everything with intention. Death, ascension. I will fly and bring her back from the stars. Conscious 